um, write the Lagrange mo the, the, the Euler Lagrange equation, um, and then exploit whatever situation you have to kind of try to solve it or rewrite it and get an equation for you. I mean, once again, here is a situation where there is no explicit dependence on the independent variable, and that kind of simplifies things quite a bit, right? But you won't be able to do that always. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, and there's one more thing on this um, um, minimal surface problem um, that is quite important. If you go back to this integrand, lambda times the square root of 1 plus psi squared, you know that once you find the solutions of the Euler Lagrange problem uh, pro uh, equations, then you find the sort of critical points. You don't know if they're minimum or they're max maxima, right? Or they're subtle points, they could be subtle points. So the next, so I think in this problem we said there either is a unique solution or there is no solution, right? Um, so what is, what if the two circles are, are close enough so there is a solution, unique? How do we know that's a minimizer? We have to use sort of the convexity of the functional, right? Well, turns out that this functional is not convex. The functional is not convex. And the functional is not convex because the integrand is not convex in both variables. So let me make that comment here. So in the case uh, when there is a solution of the Euler Lagrange equation. So the circles are close enough to each other. Um, then we still need to decide whether you know u star, let's say u star, this is c times cosine hyperbolic of 1 over cx plus d of x is a minimizer or not. Okay? Well, if you look at the integral this is not a convex functional and why not because f of lambda and psi which is lambda squared of 1 plus psi squared is not convex in lambda and psi. I mean, remember how do we how do we define convexity for a functional? We say that if you take a linear com a, a, a convex combination, so t u plus one minus t v in v in, in in the argument here, that basically translates into a convex combination u and u prime. So basically, you need convexity in both variables to kind of be able to conclude, you know, the inequalities happen so the kind of the graph looks convex, right? But this is not the case in this case. Why is this not convex? How do we check something is convex or not? The Hessian, right? So if the Hessian is not positive semi-definite, then it's not convex. 
And I'll leave this as an exercise. So since the Hessian is not positive, uh, sorry, it's not semi-positive definite. In fact, I mean, let's just do it. I mean, instead of, what's the Hessian? So think about taking with respect to lambda two derivatives. You get zero, right? If you take mixed partial derivatives with respect to lambda and xi, you get basically xi over the square root of one plus xi squared on the off the diagonal, right? And if you take two partial derivatives with respect to xi, I think we did that last time, you get lambda over the square root of one plus xi squared to the power third. Yeah? And this matrix, I don't know if for all x lambda and xi, but for positive lambda, for instance, is not positive definite. Why? Just look at the determinant. What's the determinant of this thing? It's negative. The determinant is negative means the eigenvalues have different signs. One is positive, one is negative. That's the end of it, right? So actually, if it has eigenvalues of um, different signs, right? Because the determinant is negative, and you have to be away from psi equals zero. Because if psi equals zero, then it is when psi is different from zero. If psi is zero, the determinant is zero. So then you, okay? In fact, you can plot this, and I, I'm not gonna remote now, but you can plot this and see, I mean, you really see kind of striking that it's not convex, okay? It's not a convex functional. It's not a convex integrant with respect to both, um, Variables, lambda and psi. So, looks like we're out of luck. I mean, as far as deciding you have a minimizer or not. Well, it turns out that um, in order to claim that a solution to the Euler Lagrange equation I'm going to say unique solution to the Euler Lagrange equation to be or is a minimizer for this functional It is enough for f, actually even x, you can, it, may, it may be, to be convex, well, strictly convex, actually no, convex, in psi. So it doesn't have to be convex in both lambda and psi. Of course, if if the <coughs> if the integrand doesn't depend on lambda explicitly, then that's. But in, the, in our case, it did depend on lambda, and it wasn't convex in both. But if it is only convex in psi, then that's a very kind of. A, Um, it's difficult, but it's a difficult proof to show this is this is enough. But um, the Gelfand and Farman book that I mentioned um, contains contains a, contains a proof of that, and it really has to look at the second variation. So remember, we talked about the first variation as being the just the 
we have Lagrange equations, right? We said that a necessary condition for a minimizer is the Euler-Lagrange equation have to vanish. I mean, have, uh, I'm sorry, the Euler-Lagrange equations have to be satisfied. So the left side was the first variation has to equal zero. That corresponds to the gradient being equal to zero, right? Now the second variation would have to say that you have sort of um, the second variation is positive. Okay. Uh, so since you know you'd have to say what is the second variation of a functional? How does it look? And it will involve quadratic form, quadratic forms, quadratic functionals. Um, and so it's a little bit more complicated, but. It turns out through that analysis that if you take, think about psi as being just one variable, right? Because it could be several variables we saw that we saw that. But if it's one variable, then what does it mean that uh, this is convex in psi? It basically means that so psi, you know, there's one dimensional. Then. All you have to verify is the sec is the second derivative positive. Is that the case in our problem? Well, for us, f of lambda and psi was lambda squared of 1 plus psi squared, so f second derivative is lambda over this, right? So, is this positive? Well, is this positive if lambda is positive, right? But remember the admissible solutions were was were, was when lambda was u was positive. You wanted the surface to be, you know, you wanted that path to be above the x-axis so you can rotate and make a surface out of it. So that was sort of I should have said that in the very beginning that that was part of the admissible definition of the admissible. So admissible and U positive. Yep. So in that context, F is positive. F, F, uh, I'm sorry, F is convex in psi. Okay. And, and also using the fact of the uniqueness, it implies the um, That it's a minimizer. Um, it's hard. For, I mean, it's not hard, but I'll tell you a situation when this is not the case. So, if you don't have unique solution to the Euler-Lagrange equations, so this is very important here. This only stands if you have an unique solution for the Euler-Lagrange equation, and f is convex in the third in the third variable. Then you have uh, this. Let me sh let me tell you why why this is. If you don't have a unique solution, then you don't necessarily have a minimizer. Think about the sphere. Okay. So on the sphere, so note if the Euler-Lagrange equation has more than one solution. Then the previous conclusion.
fails to hold. I mean, you don't, you cannot, I mean, even though f might be positive, I mean, might be convex in that third component. <clears throat> and the, the example is on a sphere. There's actually, uh, there's actually an exercise which says show that the points closest, I'm sorry, the, uh, given two points on a sphere, the uh, path of shortest distance is on a great circle. Okay, so, I mean, you can always rotate the sphere so that the two points are like the here and here, right? <clears throat> That's an actually a good exercise. You have to use spherical coordinates, okay? And there are only two coordinates because the third is, you know, it's 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 on a sphere of, of some fixed radius. So uh, so that would be the shortest the path of shortest line, the shortest path between the two points, right? But when you Write the Euler Lagrange equation for that length functional. What you'll find out is that there's also the other piece of the great circle that also is a solution to the Euler Lagrange equation. Okay? So and also that the, the functional, the length, you know, the integrand of that is convex in that uh, a third component. All right? Still, you cannot conclude that both of them are minimum, right? In fact, it turns out that one is maximum. Okay? And you can have a maximum because the functional itself is not convex. So it's not always like this as a, as a functional. So the, so the integrand is not jointly convex in both variables, lambda and mu, okay? lambda and psi. But um, they both satisfy the Euler-Lagrange Euler um, equation. So this is... U1 and U2 both satisfy the order Lagrange equations. And I think the same situation is but 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 you but you one is is a minimizer and you two is a maximizer. Okay. Uh, and I think the same situation occurs. There is a, one a very early example in the chapter about uh, shortest distance on a cylinder. If you have two points on a cylinder. Um, and again, you look at the, dis the shortest distance between two points. Well, if I, if, let's say the two points are opposite. Well, in that case, not opposite, but just a little bit, like like here. Okay, this is A and this is B. Then, uh, if you look in through the example, you can see that the Euler-Lagrange equation in the cylindrical coordinates says that the height is a linear function of the angle. So basically, how how can you go from this point to B? You have to go in a helix. You have to be part of a helix.
Yeah? So this would be the op this would be the shortest from A to B, right? But now if the point B is sort of here, so this is point C here, then you can go from A to C straight up and you're going to achieve, right, it's a straight line, so it's always less than the other path, right? But both the helix and the straight up line are solutions to the Euler Lagrange equation. So once again, you have multiple solutions of the Euler Lagrange equation, but one is one is the minimizer and the other one is not a maximizer. Because you could go in many, many, it would take a long time to get from A to C, right? So the other one would be a saddle point if you want. Okay? So the only, the only time you can conclude, like guarantee that you have a minimizer is when you have a unique solution to the Euler Lagrange equations. Okay? That's very important. Yep. So, so on that sphere that we talked about, would that, that other path that would be circle, would that be a uh, No, it would be a saddle point, not a maximizer. You're right. Because, yeah, you could go many different ways. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. So I, I should take that back. Yeah. Now, okay, so this is sort of, again, the theory is kind of goes into the geometry, and it's saying these are called geodesics. So you have surfaces and you have paths on surfaces that minimize distances, but for nearby points. Okay, but if the points are far apart, if the surface is curved, then if you keep you know, you may have different ways to get from one point A to point B, just like on the sphere, right? So this this minimizing the length is a very local property. You can you can always find a unique solution if you are close enough, if the two points are close enough on a surface. But if they are far enough, you may actually find different ways to get from through different geodesics from point A to point B. The other way, meaning? Like, say it's on this side, and it goes on this side of the... Yes, yes, the yes, 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 yes. It would be sort of any, heli any, any helix. Because it, all it says is, is the height, that, that uh, coordinate, is, is linear. So the derivative with respect to the angle is zero. That's all the order Lagrange equation says. Remember in the plane, you had two points. What was the Euler Lagrange equation? It's a linear function. Well, in the plane, there was only one line between two points. Whereas here, you can have several uh, of these geodesics. But one of, one of them is, is the shortest. I mean, one of the paths is the shortest. Or gives you the shortest length. Right, so you could go like, I mean, it's hard to, you'd have to rotate in. There's, there, there are other ways to get from A to B. Okay, so that's, um, that's, that's something to keep in mind. You know, you only need F to be convex in the Xi, in the last variable. That, that actually, I don't know if it's, if it, if you were wondering about the Newton's law of motion, what do we say in Newton's law of motion? We said that, yeah, the, um, I'm sorry for scrolling this. Um, it says this, it says, that for this functional, the 
all the Lagrange equations are the Newton's law of motion, right? But now you can say, well, but now let's minimize this guy. Let's minimize this action, right? How do we know that that that, that path along which the, the particle is going to move is the least action? Well, all you have to look is in this integrand and say, is this convex with respect to this one? Well, it is, because it's a quadratic, right? It's, it's far from being convex in both. Why? Because we don't know how this looks, especially the minus, you know, this could have go to negative infinity in no time, right? So you don't have a convex, nice convex function. But it is convex in this guy. So as long as you have a unique solution, and you do, because why do you have a unique solution for the euler lagrange equation? Well, Euler Lagrange is like is is m times x double prime equals something. And second order equations, well, most of them have unique solutions. So based on that, you know, deeper complicated well, complicated proof fact, right? You can conclude that actually this is a minimizer for this action. It's a minimizer for the action. You look at Yes. That would be two, two, two on the diagonal zero everywhere else. M, yeah, M, M, M. M, exactly. M, 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 M. It's a quadratic function with positive, yeah. It's positive definite. Yep. Okay. So, okay. So that basically tells you that. Um, M A equals F gives the path of least action that is minimizes the Lagrangian over, you know, let's say between two points. Two points in space under that force, for that conservative force, uh, conservative force field you have uh, not only a critical point, for a solution to the oil Lagrange, but you actually have a minimizer because, because L, L, which is one half m u prime squared minus u, is convex in second, you know, in this case is u prime is the second variable, right? But it's not convex in both. So the functional itself is not convex, but the integrand is convex in the last um, variable. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> this is pretty much the unconstrained optimization for these functionals. Unconstrained. I mean, we do have a. F we do have a. Um, how should I say? We do have an admissible set that we minimize our functionals on. Okay, that's one type of of of, cons of constraining. But the the uh, other type of constraint. So constraint. Constraint variational problems. are uh, the following. I'm going to just give an example.
And again, we still stay with the one dimensional in X. So it would be to minimize a functional that would be. So I guess that's not an example. That's sort of the general situation we're going to encounter. So f of x, u of x, u prime of x, dx. OK? And let's say that you know, we either fix the endpoints or don't. You know, that, that is not so important. Let's say we fix the endpoints. Yeah? But the admissible, I'm sorry, let me, let me not put it here. So the admissible paths are u such that u of a is a, u of b is b. But in addition, we may have some integral con constraints. So integral constraints are h of x, u of x, u prime of x, dx, might equal to something. I think we use better here. I'll give an example in a second. So you may, you may say, I want to minimize that functional, but only over paths that satisfy an additional inequality uh, an additional equality constraint like the integral of u has to be 1 that's that's one example and of course the worst is when you have also inequality integral constraints so that be that would be sort of a general situation where you uh, or a type of, of constraints that you may you may impose. Okay, so let's see an example. So first, uh, only equality integral constraint. So let's. Say minimize the integral from zero to one of u prime of x squared dx. Under the restrictions. That u of 0 is 0, u of 1 is 0, and the integral from 0 to 1, u of x is 1. How about that? Okay. Let's look at the picture. Always, always try to make a picture in your head. The picture says, you know, it's 0 to 1. I start at 0, I end at 1, um, excuse me, I end at 0 again at 1, right? But now I, I, I only can go from, from this point to that point with a function that integrates to 1. So I cannot go straight. I, I cannot stay 0 for you, right? I have to go, I have to have an area, like if u is positive, I didn't impose that condition, by the way, u is positive. So that's not a constraint. But if you were positive, then this would be exactly the area under the curve. So what's an admissible solution? That if the area is 1 underneath, then that would be admissible. Okay, now, among those solutions, among those paths, which one minimizes the derivative square? I mean, the integral of the derivative square. Okay, kind of interesting. It's kind of uh, we have no clue. We cannot guess that. I mean, we don't know what shape will actually do that. You might actually say, well, it looks symmetric, so it will be sort of like, no matter how much it goes up somewhere, it will come down. You could make those type of arguments. 
but let's let's do it the systematic way. So <clears throat> how do we do it the systematic way? We use Lagrange multipliers. <laughs> And you have again to kind of visualize this in, in, in that function space. Remember, your functional, it's nice and convex, right? But in your function space, you may not actually have the, you don't have the freedom to pick any, any path. So, you know, the minimizer to that with no, with, without this constraint, What's the minimizer of that? It's a convex. There's a low. Well, the low is zero when u prime is zero. That's the minimum, right? Because everywhere, every, everywhere else is at least zero. And u prime is zero means u is linear. Well, you have a, what function starts at zero ends at zero? Be linear. It has to be constant zero, right? So that's the unique minimizer. So in your wildest imagination. <laughs> you see this kind of, right? You see this function space. And that's the functional, right? And you see the minimum is actually in this case, it actually hits the right. But this is not admissible now. We 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 have to kind of look on a on a region on a region that's characterized by the integral of that being equal to one. that doesn't contain zero, right? So in the end, what you have is you have you have only a restricted values of the functional that you look at. And you want to know what's the minimum in that restricted set. Okay? So this is no different than in finite dimensions. What you do is you actually look for Lagrange, let's say this is a minimum now, right? Then you're going to have some sort of <coughs> matching gradients, okay? Except the matching gradients won't actually be gradients, but it will be variations, okay? And I don't want to justify this anymore because this is really kind of stretching the imagination to infinite dimensions. But just just to tell you what the so the strategy is <clears throat> when this type of, of constraints are present. Okay? Is to consider the they call it auxiliary integrand, which is f tilde equals f f is the original uh, integrand plus a Lagrange multiplier times h. Will this plays the role of Lagrange multiplier in this? Imagine space, okay? And what is this uh, um, and? Then solve the order Lagrange equations for f tilde, not f. Okay? And what is what is that Lagrange? Basically, f tilde lambda minus derivative with respect to x of f tilde psi. 
equals zero. Okay, so let's do this on that example. So what was f? f of lambda xi was xi squared. Yeah? It was just the derivative, I mean the integral of the u prime squared. So the new one will look like this. xi squared plus, oh, and what was h? Just lambda, right? Because it's the integral of u that is restricted. So it's plus z lambda. That's it, right? And now what's f with respect to lambda? F tilde with respect to lambda. It's z, right? And what's f tilde with respect to xi? 2 xi, right? So what we have is we have the Euler Lagrange which says take z minus derivative with respect to x of 2 psi, that's u prime equals 0, right? I messed it up, sorry. I messed it up. Um, okay. Well, there's there's one uh, one other thing one needs to do before that. And this has to do with the fact that when you use this, this method, at the end you will get you'll get an equation in u, like u prime or u double prime, that needs to be it needs to satisfy these two conditions. Okay? And that's gonna be hard to satisfy both conditions through that method. For instance, you can you can already see this. Um, if I continue like this, then I would get 2u double prime equals 0, okay? So basically you get that u double prime of x is, I don't know, z over 2. Okay? This has to be, uh, so z is fixed, right? So now you can say what u prime is Let's, let's just continue for a second. You integrate once, you get this. You integrate twice, you get... That's you, thank you. <clears throat> and now you have to find z, c, and d, right? Uh, and you have u of 0 is 0, so that's going to take care of d, d 0, right? Um, u of 1 is 0, so that's z over 4 plus c plus d, well d is 0, so, so that's, that's 1, right? And the last one is the integral of u from 0 to 1, so that's going to be z over 4 times 1 third plus c times a half plus d, right? And I think you can actually find in this case, let's see, so you get c is minus z over 4, and therefore 
if z over 12 plus c over 2 minus z over 8 has to equal 1. So go figure what z should be here. Yeah, I think you can find z. So, yeah, I mean, you can find a unique uh, solution. Um, help me out here. So 24, so 2z minus 3z equals 24. Z is minus 24. So C is 6. And D is 0. So you get U of X to be Z over 4. So minus 6 X squared plus C X. So it's basically 6 X 1 minus X. So you actually can do that. Uh, they got a mi minus somewhere. It's weird. They got uh, it's a typo again. Because because you cannot have that integrate to to one. It has to be. Uh, last formula on page one sixty two. You can have it negative, right? Because the integral of u has to be 1. Okay, so uh, so what's the, the shape again that minimizes that going from here to here? Parabolic. Right? Parabolic shape. And it's symmetric. Remember, I said, I mean, uh, there are certain things you can kind of anticipate, but the fact that it's the parabola that minimizes that, psh, no chance. Um, so that's that's pretty much the how you do that um, when you have equality constraints. Now, what if you have three equality constraints? What if the next, you know? If the problem says minimize this, um, under the restrictions, you know, u of 0 equals 0, u of 1 equals 0, integral of u is 1, and integral of u cubed is two. I don't know. Hmm? Again, the, the 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 imagination. It says what? Now I have to restrict to even more specialized functions. Not only that the area has to be one, I mean that's that's a restriction, but remember the area is like you know like a bubble. It's like you can move that I mean you don't restrict it to just very few, right? So an additional constraint again is gonna restrict some, but you're still gonna have lots of functions that satisfy that. So to do that you're gonna do a Lagrange multipliers with two Lagrange multipliers. Okay? This would be H H one and H two. Yes. So the homework is actually uh, an inequality. The homework has an inequality. So let me. Well, sort of. Okay. So then two Lagrange multipliers. So F tilde would be F plus Z one H one plus Z two H two. And then, uh, at the end, you have to find Z1 and Z2, and you know, and <laughs> the constants that come out of from integrations that satisfy all of those conditions. Okay. Inequality constraint, uh, integral constraints. What if you have to minimize 
a functional that is given by this integrand f under the constraint there is constraint you know maybe you have other like boundary constraints that's we know how to deal with those but g of x y g of x uh, y, u u prime less than or equal than alpha I mean you may have greater than or equal to but you know you can always make it less than or equal to right then then it's kkt type thing okay so then the idea is the same take this to be f plus they call them y instead of z which should be the mu from kkt right g and Solve right and solve Euler Lagrange for F tilde with Y positive or zero. Now zero would correspond to when that constraint is not binding. If if the if the optimal happens to have strict inequality, this means you are inside of the that imaginative region, so you don't have a equality constraint. So you shouldn't be. You should just do the Euler Lagrange for the original integrand. But if you solve the Euler Lagrange for f tilde and you happen to get y has to be zero, it means you you really having that equality, you know, satisfied instead of inequality. And what did I say? It's the other way around. So, so that uh, okay, that and g and y times the integral of g minus alpha equal to zero. So that that's what I okay. So if if you get y that's not zero, this means this must be equality. The inequality has uh, the, it has to be binding. If if um, yeah, that's, and if y is zero, then ah, then it's like solving the unconstrained one. Okay. So the example is your homework. Let's see. Let's let's let's. Uh, Number 14. It says minimize again u prime squared subject to u of 0 is less than or equal than 1, u of 1 is 1, integral from 0 to 1, u squared is less than 2, integral from 1 of, of u is 1. Two minutes to set this up. Okay, so <laughs> there is a problem here, right? How do we deal with this inequality? If this was equal to one, then we knew there would be one Lagrange multiplier for here and one one z for here and one y for here, right? Well, the point is you can when you have this kind of inequality you can also convert it to a integral inequality so first convert u of 0 less than 1 to an integral well you know what Let me do it because I have so limited time. Let me change. I'll say this is 1 and this is less than 1. It's just a little bit easier. 
It's written, yeah. The homework is as written. But I'll show you how to do this and then you'll do it for the homework. So, how do you change this to an integral inequality? Well, it's as simple as saying, well, the integral with respect of u prime from 0 to 1, we know this to be u evaluated at 0 and 1, so that's u of 1 minus u of 0, right? I mean, whether you like it or not, that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. So, in this problem, which is a little bit different from your home, uh, homework, right? What do we know? We know u0 is 1. So we know this is less than 1 minus 1. This is 0, right? And I think your homework is exactly the, is, is exactly the same, except it's greater than or equal to. Everybody's okay? So this, u of 1 less than 1 in my in this problem, and u of 0 is 1. So that's, that's that, right? And in your homework problem, it was u0 is less than 1, and this is 1. So it's greater than or equal to 0. Okay? But always you can make it into a... Okay, so since I don't want to confuse you, let's go back to your homework. <laughs> I thought it's, it's much harder to explain, but it's the same, right? So then it's basically greater than or equal to. So basically, what's the, what's the, uh, the first one? Uh, not uh, G, right? So it's basically integral from 0 to 1. Or... Integral from 0 to 1 minus u prime less than 0. So what's this is g, right? g1. What's g2? Well, that's g2, right? And what's, what's h? h is this, right? So what you have to do is you have to consider, write the functional uh, y1, g1, plus y2, g2, my, uh, plus z, h. Yeah? And in the end, remember, you have to satisfy just that u of 1 is 1, not u of 0 is less than 1. Yeah? Now, one more, one more thing, and I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's kind of late. But this, the next strategy is to so write the Euler-Lagrange equations. Actually, not even that. The next, uh, okay, and you have to have y1 integral of g1 less than zero. I'm, I'm sorry, minus. Excuse me, minus alpha one equals zero. Y2 alpha 2 equals 0, right? You have to solve this crazy looking thing. And this is done by splitting into two problems. And let me just point to the, the example in the book that does just that. Um, an example, I just don't find it now. Where is it? Inequality constraint. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay, 170 here. So the strategy is on 170. An example is 519. I mean, you don't necessarily have to do that, uh, that way, but but I mean, that's just a, a, an example worked out. I mean, the idea is that you you try to solve the Euler Lagrange equations for f tilde when um, um, in the case when y y's are zero. And then go back and consider this possibility when when this guy is zero and with this this guy is zero. Um, if it's giving you too much trouble, I would say drop on. Just, just, just minimize based on one constraint. Pick one constraint and do it that way. One inequality constraint. Because here you have two inequality constraints, so it might be a little bit. Just, just pick one. Basically, you're minimizing over a larger set. So you're not finding the minimum. Uh, you're finding a lower minimum than the minimum over a smaller set. If it gives you trouble. I mean, it just... Uh, <clears throat> okay, but keep keep in mind what you know. Kind of the big picture. What you're doing is, um, and and even try the the with the cons with the equality constraint. You know, that's basically the idea. You try with equality constraint if you consider the case. If you consider this is zero, the case this is zero, you you're actually solving the equality constraint, right? And then separately, you would treat the case when y is zero. Well, in that case, you would not have that inequality whatsoever. It just disappears. So that's basically what this splitting is done, is, is case, the two cases. Okay? But again, because we have two inequality constraints, that might be a little bit tricky. I mean, maybe I'll show you on Monday. But just, just, just uh, erase one of the two.